Well, good morning, church. I just want to welcome everybody that was able to come out today uh, in our church, as well as everybody that was able to log on today and join us from their home. We just have a great morning plan for everybody. The message is fantastic, and we, I just want to really encourage everybody that's out here today to sing and worship. Our worshiping is not for ourselves, not for the people that we're sitting beside, but God is, we are called to sing praises to God. Amen? And so at this, in this time that we're at, we are encouraging you to worship and sing for God. And that means that we need to put on a mask. And if it means that I just have to put on a little mask so that I could worship God, amen. Not a big deal. So I encourage you that if you, uh, for singing and worshiping, please, uh, we have t a lot of masks out in the front entrance. Uh, they'll be happy to give you one if you feel like you would uh, like to do that. So again, I just welcome everybody out today. And, uh, you know, we are people that love God, love other people, and we want to serve. Amen? Amen. Okay, well, let's stand and pray. We'll start worship. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the sun shining today, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, for the gifts that we've received. Lord, be there now with us, Lord God, as we, as we listen to the praises to you, Lord God. Amen. Amen.
for making us new in you, God. You turn our mourning into dancing, God, and we can always run to you, Lord. God, we just thank you for your open arms this morning, Lord, that we can come into your arms, Lord, and run to you with all that we're going through, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. But I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation. Let it all go. Well, I see it now. I'm laying it down. And I know that I need you. I run to the Father. I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding. No reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon. My soul needs so I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again.
and you. You guys feel free yet? I think we need to do that one more time. I think we just need one more. We'll dance till the chains fall. We will dance till the chains fall. so awesome. You're so awesome, Lord. And I thank you for the freedom that you give. I thank you, Father, for the new life that you provide for us. Lord, I thank you, Father, that you didn't come to give us rules and regulations. But, Father, you came to give us life and abundant life as well, too, Father. So, Father, it's with grateful, overflowing hearts that we take off my, that I take off my mask and that we praise you and we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's give our praise and worship team a... How many of you think we should just keep going with them this morning? You know, there's just something about getting together and praising the Lord with live praise and worship that's just over the top. I have an announcement to make before I begin with my message. Um, We're going to make a few changes in the church. Some of them you'll feel now, some of them you'll feel a little later on. But uh, Todd is going to take over the ushering. You know, Todd is a real expert on being friendly to people and uh, and portraying the vision for our church. So um, we look forward to Todd. He's going to take it over next week. And we're not, um, Brad isn't stepping down because Brad is doing a bad job. That's not the issue at all. But Brad has done such an awesome job with his small group over the last year or two. And it's really growing. And there's a huge amount of people that go to his to his group, and so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to put him in charge of our small groups in the church here, and uh, he'll take over that. Well, he's taken over it now, but in the fall, we'll come up with some new ideas and some different things that will happen. So I am really excited about that. But I want to continue talking this morning about interpreting the times, interpreting the time, the season that we're in. So let's bow our heads and pray before I begin. Father, I just ask, Lord, that once again you would put your words in my mouth, that I would be able to adequately and accurately um, say to 
uh, the people here and the people online what you're saying to us in this season. Lord, I thank you that uh, you want us to be prepared and to be ready for what's going on. So, Father, just um, make the message plain so that we can run with it and so that we can grow and experience more of you every day of our life. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, interpreting the times. You know, Jesus said to a crowd in Luke chapter 12, he said, You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. In other words, you know how to interpret the weather. You can see a storm coming in the west, you know that you're probably going to have rain. Right? That's true for us too. We can see stuff coming in over the mountains. Well, we can imagine the mountains are there. But we can see stuff coming from the west and we can kind of tell what the weather's going to be like. So Jesus said, you know how to interpret the earth and the sky. Why don't you know how to interpret the present time? You see, I believe that we're going into a time in our country, the world is going into a time that we need to be prepared for. You know, I really hope I'm wrong, and I honestly say that, but I just don't see us really getting back to normal. I'm not saying that there aren't people going to be blessed and that everything's falling apart, but I think we need to understand the season we're in and we need to be prepared for what lies ahead. You know, I didn't say this in the first service, but I think it's, it's plain. Um, I can see how an anti-Christian sentiment is growing in our country. And as our church, you know, gets more of a presence as we're online and people are starting to notice us, I also notice more opposition into what we're trying to do. But you know what? You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, beware when all men speak well of you. So throw in for free, you know, if everybody's against you, you probably need to pay attention to that. But so, what's good though is if a few people don't like what you're doing, so. I don't want people not to like what we're doing. I just think I'm so pretty and lovable that the whole world should, should love me. How many of you would agree with that? And please don't, please don't respond to my, to my ignorance. But you know, this isn't a message of doom and gloom. This isn't a message of that everything is going to fall apart and that we're going to be all hard done by. That's not this message at all. But the message is we need to be prepared for what lies ahead, right? We just do. And whether uh, we're going into a season of prosperity and a season of wealth, you need to be prepared for that too. So we want to be prepared. So how do we prepare well, what I want to look at this morning is the topic faith. And I probably have a little different message than you've heard before about faith, but that's good. I hate to um, just repeat what you've heard before. I want to look at faith, and I want to look at how we can trust in God, because I think we, this is one area that we need to grow in. We need to grow in faith, and it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 20 minutes, or it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 80 years. This is an area that you need to grow in. We all need to grow in Learning to trust God and learning to have faith. Jesus made a couple references for faith. Well, he made many of them actually, but I just want to share two of them, two of them, two of them with you this morning. Jesus said to a blind man once in, in Mark 10, he said, go your way, your faith has made you well. Can you see faith is important in that? And the man was healed when Jesus said that. Also in Luke 17, 6, um, Jesus said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, a very small seed, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. You know, some people wonder, well, of course Jesus wasn't being literal, but I think he was. I think Jesus was being literal. I think faith is incredibly important. The other thing that I want you to see about having faith like a mustard seed, Jesus said that a mustard seed grows into a, well, not the seed grows, but out of a mustard seed grows a big plant so big that birds come and make their nests. 
So the moral of the story is faith is very important. And we can all grow in faith. And it's important that we understand that we can grow in faith. So there's some things that we can do actually to develop our faith. The first thing I have this morning is get to know God. This is kind of a rehearsing of what I said last week. But what is so important in life, what is so important is for us to get to know who He really is. This is the basis for everything in life. That we understand who God really is. We come to the place where we understand that he's overwhelmingly loving towards us, that he looks after us. And what I've said so often now is you can trust in God's love for you. You don't have to go into situations thinking that the world is going to end because you can know that God trusts you. Actually, I misspoke, but actually that's true. You know, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says love trusts. And the reality is, is that if God is love, then he trusts us. Isn't that incredible when you think about that? God trusts you. God trusts me. I, you know, I think when we can understand and when we can grasp the incredible God that He is, the incredible way that He looks after us, the incredible provision that He makes for us, I think it's just overwhelming. But one thing that's really important, if we're going to grow in the love that God has, if we're going to understand who He really is, what we need to do is to lay aside our past hurts. Those things, our past hurts or our past disappointments, will take us off track and will really um, keep us from experiencing the life that God has for us. So, I mean, the reality is everybody has disappointments. Everybody has some things that have gone wrong in their life, and I'm not diminishing yours, and I'm not saying that yours are are um, less than, than anybody, or that, yeah, that yours are are less than anybody else's because all of our pain is different. And there's people who have gone through incredible um, seasons of pain in their life. But you see, if that's what we get our identity from, if that's the thing that controls us, it also will keep us from moving forward and experiencing the more that God has for us. So lay aside your past hurts and trust in the love that God has for you. And you will find that there's a whole new world that opens up for you. My second point this morning is learn to be a real disciple of Jesus. Not just in name only, but learn to be a real disciple of Jesus. Make Jesus your absolute number one priority in life. You know, Jesus told his disciples once, told people once, if you want to be my disciple, you must, and I like the way this version of the Bible puts it, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. This isn't saying that you need to hate other people. But what it is saying is you need to make God such a priority in your life. He needs to be number one to such a degree that everything else fades in comparison to Him. There isn't one person in your life that's more important. There isn't one thing in your life that's more important. And if you want to be His disciple, this is what you need to do. You have to make Him number one. Look at what Jesus says after that. He says, You must by comparison hate everyone else. And then He lists your father and mother, your wife and children, Brothers and sisters, less, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you can't be my disciple. Nobody likes to hear this stuff, right? But you, you want to know a secret that makes this easier? You want to know a secret that makes this better? If you put God as number one in your life, your relationship with your spouse will be a million times better. 
If you put Jesus as number one in your life, you will have far more love for your children. Far more love for your parents. You see, if you put Jesus absolutely as number one in your life, your relationships will ev- with everyone else will improve a million percent. I can't, I can't, under, oh, I can't overstate that enough. Following God needs to be a number one priority in your life. And I like what it says in 2 Corinthians 2.14. You see, if you make God number one in your life, the Apostle Paul said, Thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. Always leads us. In triumphal procession, or always brings victory to us. I'm not saying that absolutely everything is going to go wonderfully in your life, that you're going to just, like I've said before, tiptoe through the tulips and everything is going to be wonderful. But I'm telling you something far richer and far greater. When God is your source, when He's the number one thing in your life, the number one person in your life, when he's number one, everything else will fade in comparison to him. So learn to be a real disciple. You know, if you want to be prepared for this, um, for what might be lying in the future, if you want to be prepared, push into him, learn to be a real disciple, and go all the way with him. My third and final point And how many of you are really excited because you think this is going to be a super short message? Chuck is already on his last point. Don't anybody respond to that, please. But my third and my main point this morning, what I want to share with you is, understand what real faith is. Understand what real faith really is. You know, Jesus was healing people. And a large crowd was following him. And he went to the top of a mountain where there was a grassy area. And he's there and he looks and he sees there's 5,000 people coming. He'd been healing people. He'd been performing miracles. And here's a crowd of 5,000 people coming. And if you've never been in ministry or whatever, you think, wow, that's really exciting. But if you've been ministering to people like that all the time, every day, it's, oh brother, here's 5,000 people coming again. And so Jesus asked Philip, he says, how are we going to feed all of these people? Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do, but he's testing Philip. How are we going to feed all of these people? And Philip responds with, well, even if we had eight months wages, we still would have a hard time feeding this huge crowd that's coming. And then Andrew pipes up and Andrew says, you know, here's a boy with five loaves and two fish. But I mean, 5,000 people, how is that going to work out? And you know what Jesus said? He said, tell the people to sit down on the grass. And then he prayed, and he broke bread, and everyone had more than enough. In fact, there was 12 baskets full left over. If you don't understand that God is a good God, that God is a God of abundance, think about that miracle for a little bit. God wants to bless you abundantly. That's his heart for us. He wants us to have a deeper, richer, more meaningful relationship with us. He's not withholding himself from us. But God is such an awesome God, and you can see his heart in this story. But let me make a couple applications from the story. The first one is that when you think that God is calling you to do something, and when it's more than just a passing feeling, but when you really believe that God has called you to do something, He will take the little resources that you have and turn it into something amazing. 
You may think that you don't have enough talent, that you don't have enough money to fulfill the call that God has on your life. And I want you to think, I want you to know that if that's the way you're thinking, you're making a mistake. Because God will take the little that you have and turn it into something amazing. Don't ever think that you don't have enough. With God and with faith, you can do whatever He's called you to do. Isn't that amazing? God can do amazing things in your life. Just have the faith to step out. Have the faith to push forward. Have the faith, the faith to, to be obedient to what he's talking about. You see, you will see amazing things if you're willing to step out. But if you're just sitting there thinking, you know what, I don't have the, the, what it takes to do this, then you'll, never, then you'll never experience the blessing that God has for you as well. We need to push forward. We need to push into what God has for us. We need to grow in faith in this area. You can do whatever God has called you to do. He can feed 5,000 people from five loaves of bread and a couple of fish. So this amazing thing happens. And then Jesus knows that they're going to, this crowd is going to take him by force and make him their king. And so you, don't know, so you know what Jesus does? He disappears. He goes off into the mountains to be by himself. You see, in actuality, when you think about it, what the people were looking for was the provisions of the desert. Let me explain what I'm talking about. Remember how um, it, the nation of Israel were slaves in Egypt for 400 years? And then God moved supernaturally to set them free, supernaturally to, to deliver them, and to get to the promised land, the amazing place of abundance that God had for them, they had to spend 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years to get to the place where they would really trust God. Where they would really understand that God was involved in their life. And during this 40 years when they were in the wilderness, God did some over-the-top amazing things. Their clothes never wore out. Their shoes never wore out. Isn't that amazing? You know, God provided food for them. He provided manna and he provided quail for them. Not only that, but when they really needed water, God provided water for them. The, the provisions of God was just over the top. And it was um, such an abundant place. I mean, even think about it. There was a pillar of fire to look over, to um, guide them and lead them at night. But think, a pillar of fire would have provided light for the camp. Who needs street lights, right? There's a pillar of fire... And I can just hear some of the grumpy old men saying, hey, um, we need to change things in our tent because I don't want to be looking at the pillar of fire all the time. I need dark if I'm going to sleep. Anybody identify with that? Nobody. Oh, brother. Okay, one or two people. Okay, I promise my illustrations. Well, I don't promise, but hopefully my illustrations will get better as we move along here. And you know, there was um, clouds over the camp in the daytime. You know what clouds do? They provide shade. They, they protect you from the heat. So there's all of these overwhelming things that God is doing for the people. But you know what? They're in the wilderness. And God is taking them from the wilderness to an abundant place. And you know, as soon as they crossed the river into the promised land, you know what happened? All of this supernatural stuff that God had done to look after them, the pillar of fire ended, the, the clouds over them in the daytime ended, the food ended, the water ended. Do you know what God wanted them to do? God wanted them to take the resources of this amazing land that he had brought them to and to work and make things apply in their lives. 
He wanted them to use the resources of the land. You see, I think so often in life what we want is we want the promises of the desert to apply to us when we're in the promised land. And God is saying, no, I don't want to do all of these things. I love you and I've provided for you. But take the things that are in the land, move forward with the things that are in the land, and you will be blessed and you will be prosperous. But just don't expect that I'm going to absolutely do everything for you anymore. Do you get that? We make a mistake When we think that all we're supposed to do is sit on the couch and pray occasionally and try really hard to believe that God is going to look after us. God wants us to make some effort and to do some things ourselves. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. And I apologize if I've said this before to you. But this church operates in faith far more than probably most of you know. Probably far more than most of you understand. You see, we've been through quite a season in the church here in the last few months. Come on. You know, we had to record our services and we were really scrambling. We were way behind when all of a sudden the government said, No more meeting together. No more groups of more than 15 people, or no groups more than 15 people. And so, thanks to some awesome people in our church, we were able to record a message. We would record it, and then we would show it on Sunday morning. And we really had to work to make that happen, right? We couldn't just sit down and, well, everything's going to go on as normal. To feed people and to encourage people, we saw that we had to be online and had to be ready to go in a week's time. Now you talk about work and you talk about scrambling to make things happen. And thank God we had people that were willing to do that to make that happen. And then after, in all reality, then after, in, after a couple months, two and a half months, I was visiting with another pastor from the city here. He's not the senior pastor, but he was saying that, you know what, the services online are starting to get boring. And if you're watching online... I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the people who are... No, that's not true. But isn't that reality, though? Come on. In, in reality, the service would be on, and you'd think, oh, man, I need a cup of coffee. And so you'd go get some coffee, and then you're in the kitchen, and you think, you know what? Toast would really be good to go along with the, with, the, with the coffee. And so you make toast. And this is another pastor. He's telling me this. And I'm thinking, you know what? We need to make some changes in the church because this is reality. And I, could underst- I can absolutely understand that. And so what we did, what, I, I dis- what myself and the board decided was that we need to um, do live services. Even if we can't have any people in the congregation, there are things that needed to be addressed that were happening in the time and the season. And if you're going to record your message early in the week, you're going to miss things and you're not going to be nearly as relevant as if... You're doing things live. So I decided, okay, I can see how people are starting to get bored. And I mean, I could look at our numbers and I could see they're going down. And I mean, I think our praise and worship people and everything, they were doing an awesome job. But watching online is just not as exciting. And the problem was, we didn't have money for equipment. And it was going to cost us several thousands of dollars to be able to stream live and to stream online. And so we got together as deacons and we decided, we decided that yes, this is something that we absolutely need to do. We need to be able to, to do things live whether there's people here or not, to try to keep things a little current and to try to um, be interesting for people. And then... And then we figured out how we could make this work 
money-wise. You see, we didn't just sit down and say, okay, this is something we're supposed to do. I think God is going to provide everything, and so we can just spend twice as much as we really need to spend, and everything's going to be fine, everything's going to be okay. We made things work in the natural. You see, we put in the time and we put in the effort and we, and we thought it through and we could see how God could, um, how we could make this work. And so we proceeded to, to buy equipment and to get started. And you know what happened at that same time? Victory, I love our organization, Victory Church has said, hey, you know, you guys were promised $3,000 15 years ago. And I know you didn't need it at the time, but we would just like to um, give you that money if you would like to have it, and you'd like to. I'm like, yes. <laughs> you know, part of the bad thing is, is that it ruined um, some of my bragging. Hey, Victory said we could have so much to get started here, and we didn't even use it all. And so, hey, aren't we good? So I can't say that anymore. But what I can brag about, though, is the organization came through without even knowing what we were going through. The organization came through when we needed money. Not only that, but our government, and I appreciate this, our government had some programs for businesses at that time that the church qualified for, so we received some money from the government. And you know what? At the end of the day, we had more money than we needed for our equipment. What I'm saying to you, though, is don't just sit back and do nothing and think that everything is going to fall in your place. That's desert theology. But understand that God is going to take your little if you're faithful and if he's called you to do something, you can move forward in that and you will be successful. And in my life, I've experienced this time after time after time after time. But I get frustrated with people, in all honesty, I get frustrated with people sometimes who they just think everything's going to work together and everything's going to fall into place and I don't need to do anything. You know, there are times when you can be prepared and you can do everything that you're going to do and it still won't work out. And so what do you do in a period of time like that? You remain faithful, you keep pushing in, you keep pushing forward, and you will see God come through in the end. There was a period in my life where I didn't have a good job for two years. And I really thought that I was done. This is before I was in ministry. I really thought I was done. I thought I was going to be living for minimum wage for the rest of my life. And God performed a miracle to give me some encouragement, to give me some strength. And God turned that desert two-year experience into my moving forward in ministry. Isn't God good? I just use that as an illustration. When you're going through a time and you're doing all of the preparation and you're trying to make sense of it all, don't quit and don't give up. I did. Don't be like me. God has amazing things for us, but we need, to, we need to work for things to happen. Look at what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 2. He said, work hard to show the results of your salvation. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. This is not that you're working, work hard for your salvation. Don't work hard to be saved, but work hard so that you can experience what we've talked about, the kingdom of God, so that we can move in to what God has for us. I want you to know that that's going to take some time, and that's going to take some energy, and it's not going to come with you sitting on the couch and watching TV all day, or playing video games, or whatever else that is really tempting, or playing on our phone. I know I'm meddling now, so I should move on. But don't think faith 
is you doing nothing. And let me tell you something else for free. When you decide that you're going to get active and you're going to serve God and you're going to follow Him, He will steer you in the direction that you need to go. But sitting at home and just thinking, oh well, you know, something's going to fall into my lap. God's going to bless me and you're trying to believe that. I don't believe that's faith. I believe that's a desert mentality and we shouldn't have a desert mentality. You know what else he says in this passage? Work hard to show the results of your salvation. And then he talks about obeying God. We've talked about that already. That's discipleship, learning to obey God. And then he talks about with a deep reverence and fear. Nobody likes to have fun more than I like to have fun. For those of you who know me, you know that's the case. But I tell you, when it comes to God, I have a deep reverence and a deep fear. Things need to be entertaining for me with my personality, and I know I'm probably a little warped. But come on, I know there's some of us here, I know there's a few of us here who, you know what, you're, you're going to a program, not a church program, but you're going to a program and there's 12 things on the agenda and what you start to do is to check off the things. Oh, we're on four, we got eight more to go. Come on. Isn't anybody like that? You know, or... And I'm really meddling now. You know, to me, to me, watching the kids in school, I had four daughters and I had four clarinet players. And then you would go to this recital for the children. I know you guys are way better than I am, but oh, brother, is this ever going to end? Your child is sitting in the back row of the the clarinet players and they're in grade whatever it is when they start, grade three, and it's nothing but squeaking, and you've heard nothing but squeaking in your house for the last two months. (laughs) And you know what's really weird? There are parents, there are parents that come early so that they can sit in the front row to see this production. They're way better parents than I was. But with my personality, things need to be exciting. So we can have fun. We can have fun serving the Lord. But you know what? We need to understand that God is a holy God. And we need to serve Him with reverence and with fear. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. You know, to have faith, it doesn't mean that we do, that we don't, excuse me, that we don't do anything. Jesus didn't come to set us free from work and for us to be lazy. So we need to operate by faith, trusting God, trusting God for the results, but we need to do things ourselves, and we need to move forward. You know, I so believe these things in my heart. It's not just about us. Faith is not just about us not doing ill any illustration. You know, you know we used to think We used to think that we were being more spiritual if we wouldn't do any preparation. The church used to be, when I was growing up, the church used to be, and we made fun of it, two songs, an offering, and a message. And hopefully the message was absolutely as short as possible. And then God moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we thought being spiritual was when we um, didn't plan anything. 
So the pastor was being way more spiritual if he would stand up in front of the congregation on Sunday morning and he would say, um, God changed my message this morning. And then, ooh. Or the song leader would um, stand up and he wouldn't have any um, order of service or nothing practiced or prepared, but he would just start strumming on his guitar and he would just, whatever song came to mind, he would lead. You know, that's wrong theology. That's not more spiritual. You know what I believe today? And God can change your message, and I'm so thankful for this church that we can change our program, we can do whatever we need to do on Sunday morning to follow the movement of the Holy Spirit, and we do do that occasionally, and I'm so glad we have the freedom to do that. But you know what? If God were to change my sermon on Sunday morning, which I would be all in favor if he wanted to do that, but if God was to change my sermon on Sunday morning, it would mean I miss God on Saturday. God wants us to work. God wants us to do amazing things for his kingdom. You know what Jesus said? Jesus gave a couple of illustrations as well, too. Jesus said, if you're going to build a house, figure how much it's going to cost. Otherwise, you'll get it half done and people will make fun of you that you can't finish it. Plan and do some work. Jesus talked about two kings that were going to war against each other. He said, if, you're, if um, you think you can't win the battle, then you need to make peace with the other king. In other words, plan ahead. Plan ahead, and there's a practicality to some of this stuff. All the while, totally trusting in the Lord. All the while, understand that it's not your efforts that are going to do anything. It's not your efforts that are going to bring the results that you want. But it's God who will produce the results of what you're doing. This is a totally different way to live. Not to have a desert mentality. Not to have a desert mentality. But understand that if God has called you to do something, you're willing to step forward. And you're willing to be obedient to him and watch him do the amazing thing and bring the increase. In our service this morning, when we were done, I've had, I had a couple people that I can remember came to me and said this last week, I've really been blessed. One guy had told me about some money that was given to him that allowed him to provide for what he um, needed to live. He could buy a pair of shoes because money was given to him. Isn't that amazing? You see, that's the God I serve. You know, uh, some other stories that were similar to that. God provides. God absolutely provides, and we can trust in him. And I live my whole life according to this principle. I really do. But you know what? I understand that my own efforts are nothing unless God gets involved, unless God um, provides the increase. You see, if we can understand that, if we can understand these principles, then we'll grow in faith. Get to know who God is. Really understand who He is. Learn and make an effort to expand your faith in God. And then my third point, I kind of hinted at this, but I don't have time to really get into it, is learn to really hear his voice. So often what we want is just God to, we imagine things, and then we want God to take our imaginations and to make them work. Oh man, I could talk for a long time. And you know what? You can really hear God's voice and that still doesn't guarantee you that the thing that you're trying to do is going to turn out the way you want it to. 
That's what makes this whole life really interesting. But understand that you can trust in him. And don't think that you have to have absolutely everything figured out. You know what? If we waited until we had the extra money in the bank before we made any um, attempt at streaming online or any attempt of going live, you know what? We still wouldn't be online. But we worked and we put some time and energy into making it happen and God provided. God will provide for you. God will look after you. Trust in him and you will see amazing things happen. And he will steer you and guide you and direct you. And you know what's so cool? That even if you fail, God will turn that into good for you. We've got so much going for us as Christians. We really do. Let's take advantage and let's prepare in the season that we're in. Father, I thank you so much for the provision that you have for us. Lord, I pray that there wouldn't be one person here that would uh, want to um, either be lazy or to cut and run from what you have for them, Lord. But that each person, Father, would follow you, would have faith in you, would do the work that it takes to go into the next season and to be successful in whatever lies ahead. Father, pour out your Spirit upon us. How many of you will say honestly this morning, Chuck, I'm going to make a decision to go all the way with God. I'm going to make a decision to grow in faith so that I can be ready for what lies ahead. Just show me by raising your hand. Yeah, hands all over the place. Father, pour out your spirit upon these people. Father, these are such awesome people. And I know that you passionately love each one. Minister your grace to them. Father, I also ask that there wouldn't be a person leave this place who just says, yeah, I don't believe that. But Father, we would taste and see, each one of us would taste and see that you are good, that you are loving, and that you care about each one of us. And if there's anyone who's here or anybody who's online and watching and you've never really given your life to Jesus Christ, I would so encourage you to make that choice today. You know what? This isn't a big, huge, complicated process, but just talk honestly to God. Just tell Him, you know, I want to be a follower of yours. I'm sorry for the mistakes that I've made in the past but I want to go all the way with you. And I can guarantee you, if you start on this journey, if you pray a simple prayer like that, and you're just honest before God, even if you have doubts, and even if you have questions, just say, God, I don't understand everything, but I want to be a follower of yours. I want to experience what Chuck is talking about. I would really encourage you to make that choice to go all the way with God. And if you've made that choice, don't just keep it to yourself, but have the courage to tell somebody else. Have the courage to get in contact with us at the church. We have some material that we'd love to give you, a Bible, etc., etc., some stuff that will help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus. And I don't care if you're watching from across the country. We will send stuff to you because we want you to be ready in this season that lies in front of us, whatever it holds, and we want you to experience God's grace and His goodness. Won't you join me in following Jesus and being a true disciple of His and growing in discipleship and growing in faith? That's my heart. I don't have it all together. But you know what? I want to move forward in what God has for me and what God has for this church. Father, I thank you so much. Bless this people, Lord. And Father, um, just minister your grace to them. Rich, why don't you come and close the meeting? 
Thank you, Pastor Chuck. Well, expand your faith in Christ. Amen. Well, we're going to take up an offering here shortly. Uh, first, I have a, some fantastic announcements to be made. River baptism, August 16th. Amen? Amen. Who's been baptized in a river? Hands up high. One, two, a couple. Right on. It was fantastic last year. We had a baptism. We had a picnic, a family picnic. It was great. Uh, the church is going to supply hot dogs and buns and condiments, but you are responsible to pack your own picnic lunch. So if there's anything else that you would like to bring, you need to bring that for your family. But we will provide those others. Uh, also, if you are interested in being baptized on the 16th of August, you need to let the church know. For those of you that are here in the church, there's cards in front of you. Fill those out. For those of you that are at home, this is an opportunity for you as well. Go to the website. It's vcrd.ca connect. I have decided. Send a message off to the church. Also, uh, for any other further church events, you can all have a look at vcrd.ca events, and that will all be on there as well. Our offering envelopes are in the seats in front of you. And we have two boxes, one in the back of the sanctuary where they can be put into and as well at the information center. And the debit machine will be there as well as it usually usually is. And again, we have our uh, ways to give, mobile giving, e-transferring, and of course our online and right here in the church. So let's all stand. We're going to pray for the offering. You know... Just as Pastor Chuck was preaching this morning, uh, <clears throat> the offering is an act of faith. We want to learn to expand our faith in Christ. You need to move. We need to move. And the offering is moving. It's an act of faith. It's doing something that shows that we have trust in God. It's helping us to keep our priorities straight. And it reminds us that we don't own any we don't own anything in this life. God owns it. And we're just managing it for him. And when you take that ownership off of the things that we value in this world, like our finances and so on, there's a freedom that you have when you know that God is in control. So let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Lord God, Lord, I just ask that you speak to each one of us, Lord God, that our hearts are open to receive, Lord God, that we could take this message today, Lord, and that we can live by it, Lord. Lord, show us how we can build our faith in you. Lord, show us your words that you have for us. Lord, where, where I have weaknesses, Lord God, I ask that you show us how we can get past those weaknesses, Lord. We want to hear your voice in our lives. And Lord, bless. we just ask for a blessing upon this, not just this church, but our church body. Lord God, that our finances will be abundant in your name, Lord God. That are those of us that are looking for work, Lord, that the opportunities will become abundant, Lord. Help us with each step that we take. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you all for attending online and for coming into church today. We just uh, really appreciate it. Thank you.